Hey, my name's Anna. My life's kind of been one for the books, and by that, I mean it's like ripping off a band-aid. Quick, kind of painful, and mostly forgettable. If you got a minute or two, pull up a chair. I've got a sava that'll make you thankful for your crazy relatives. Let's start with my so-called family picture. A quaint little house with a white picket fence, backyard BBQs, and a family dog named Buster who's missing a few patches of fur. That's where the Norman Rockwell painting ends. Inside that picture-perfect home was my big sister Rachel, basically the queen bee. Then there's me. I guess I was like the worker bee, just buzzing around, doing my thing, barely noticed. I got to hand it to Rachel, though. She knew how to play the game. Blonde, a smile that could light up a dive bar, and away with words that made our folks melt like a popsicle in July. She snagged everything growing up. A shiny new bike, the last slice of pizza, also the big fuzzy sweater I was eyeing for Christmas. You guessed it, Rachel's. And when she turned on the charm, it was game over. Mom, Dad, can I please, please get that dress for prom? She'd bat her eyes and they fell for it every time. Me, though. I'd get the leftovers and the hand-me-downs. But don't get me wrong, I wasn't exactly Oliver Twist or anything. Got clothes on my back, a roof over my head. But let's just say life wasn't handing me any silver spoons. Now, my folks. Dad worked the kind of job where he came home with grease under his nails and a tired smile. Mom, she was a wizard with a spatula and a knack for sniffing out BS, unless it came from Rachel. When Rachel got into that fancy pants college with the big lawns and the ivy-covered walls, it was like Christmas came early and stayed late. Mom and Dad threw a party that could wake the dead. But by the time I was ready to start thinking about my own future, the parade had long passed. Suddenly it was all, money's tight, Anna and real life's about making sacrifices, you know. I remember them breaking the news, sitting at the kitchen table that had a wobbly leg. Dad was scratching the back of his neck, a sure sign he wasn't keen on the conversation. Anna, we've been crunching the numbers, and it's just not looking good, he said. You got to be realistic, Anna. Mom piped in, stirring her coffee, even though it didn't need any. College ain't cheap. Maybe it's time you think about getting a job, you know, help out a bit. The way they danced around it, you'd think they were telling me Buster ran off to join the circus rather than just saying straight that my dreams were too expensive. So there I was, not even eighteen and slapped with the reality that school was a no-go. I wasn't about to roll over and let dreams die, you know? My plan was as plain as it could be. Work my fingers to the bone, save every penny, and get myself into that courtroom someday with Esk tagged to the end of my name. The jobs I had weren't glamorous by any stretch. By day, I was slinging coffee and dodging pastry crumbs. By night, I was up to my elbows in suds, washing dishes at a diner that had seen better days. You've got to be the hardest working person I know, Anna, Emily said one night in our dingy little kitchen. She was a freelance graphic designer with a laugh that could light up the whole block. Yeah, agreed Trish, who was stringing her bass guitar, getting ready for a gig with her band. If there's anyone who can pull this off, it's you. Their words were like a pat on the back, a cheer from the sidelines that kept my feet moving. Everything was on track, maybe a bit behind schedule, but what's life without a few delays, right? Then just like that, it all came crashing down. I woke up one morning with what I thought was a killer flu. Turns out it was way more serious. Long story short, I landed in the hospital with a stack of medical bills that looked like the Encyclopedia Britannica. Miss Anna, your insurance covered some of it, but the lady at the billing department had a voice that sounded like she was always about to deliver bad news, which she did. Big time. You still owe quite a bit, she said, 
pushing a bill across the desk that made my heart sink into my sneakers. There went my college fund, swallowed up by numbers and decimal points I could barely comprehend. I tried to plead my case, get a payment plan or something. Look, I got nothing, I told her, every part of me wanting to crawl into a hole and give up. It's not personal, Han. It's just the system, she replied. But it sure felt personal to me. Back at our apartment, the atmosphere was as stale as the pizza we left out overnight. There go the textbooks, I muttered, flipping through the pages of legal definitions I still hadn't memorized. We sat there, three dreams deferred, wrapped up in the brutal honesty of our cramped living space. What next? Trish asked after a silence that overstayed its welcome. I didn't have an answer, just a bunch of question marks dancing around my head. I was back to square one, but somehow it felt like I was even further behind than when I started. Start over, I finally said. What else can I do? I'm not cut out for giving up. It sounded good, but even I heard the quiver in my voice. Both of them nodded, but there was no hiding the worry lines etched deep into the moment. Yeah, I understand. Our house is too crowded. I whispered into the phone, the words bitter as they left my mouth. Mom didn't see me swallow the lump in my throat or the way my hand shook. You're tough, Anna. You'll figure it out, Dad offered up before he handed the phone back to Mom. The bus stop bench was hard against my back. I sat there, figuring out my next move, while people with places to be rushed past me. Rachel, with her new baby and her picture-perfect life, didn't even come to the phone, probably didn't want to catch my bad luck through the receiver. Family, right. The guy waiting next to me snorted, catching the tail end of my phone call. He was wearing a jacket that had seen better winters and a five o'clock shadow sitting at eight o'clock. Yeah, family, I echoed, not really in the mood to chat, but there was a solace in talking to a stranger. Hey, don't let it beak you. You look like you've got fighting you, he said, crinkling the paper bag in his hand. I managed a half smile. Got any tips for sleeping on one of these seats? I joked, but the humor didn't quite reach my eyes. He looked over, squinting as if he was sizing up the bench. Buses run all night. Ride M end to end. Safer than a bench. His words hung in the air as my phone buzzed with a low battery warning. Great, add that to the list of today's hits. The bus hissed as it came to a stop in front of us, its doors yawning open, inviting us to go wherever it might take us. The guy got on the bus, finding a seat among the tired faces of nighttime commuters. I stayed back, bus fare tight in my fist, not ready to commit to just riding around in circles yet. I pulled my suitcase and started walking, the wheels drumming a lonely beat on the sidewalk. The streetlights flickered overhead, and in their stuttering light, I made a silent vow. This isn't how my story ends. Holding on to that thought, I walked through the night. Every step was a defiance, every breath a promise that I would claw my way out of this hole. Come on over, kid. Aunt Marlene's voice came through the other end like it was pulling me out of quicksand. I never thought I'd be so happy to hear that raspy tone of hers. When I got to her place, she didn't waste time on pleasantries or useless small talk. You look like hell, was her greeting as she ushered me in, her hand firm on my back. I spent the first few days in her guest room, trying to piece myself back together. She didn't press me for details. She wasn't the type for cozy heart-to-hearts, but I could tell she was waiting for me to start talking. Finally, as we sat at her cluttered kitchen table flanked by plants that seemed as tough as she was, Aunt Marlene set down her mug and looked at me with those piercing eyes. What do you want, Anna? Really want? It made me nervous, like I was on one of those makeover shows, and this was the big reveal. But I was too tired to beat around the bush. I want to be a lawyer, Aunt Marlene. My voice carried an edge of desperation I could no longer hide. 
She nodded as if she already knew it. If that's the case, she started, tapping her fingers on the table, the clinking sound mingling with the tick-tock of the wall clock, I'll pay for your education. My heart jolted like it got hit by a punch of hope. You serious as a heart attack? But she raised her finger, slicing the air with her condition. You keep your grades up. No slacking. Her words were stern, yet there was a spark in her eyes telling me she believed in me. Really? I couldn't help the grin that broke through. Thank you. The words getting crushed between us. None of that mushy stuff, she grumbled, but she patted my back before shooing me off. And you're going to work for me part-time. I need more help around here than I care to admit. What kind of work? I was eager, ready to do just about anything. The kind that needs doing, she replied vaguely, with a dismissive wave of her hand. We'll start with that jungle you call a herdo and move on to the yard work tomorrow. I laughed. It was a hearty, genuine sound I hadn't heard from myself in a while. Deal? Don't think I'm just being nice, Aunt Marlene warned. You fall off, get lazy, and the deal's off. I shook my head, the seriousness settling back in. Won't happen. She eyed me for a long moment, then smiled. Good. Now help me with these damn plants. They've got a better social life than I do. I spent the rest of the day covered in soil, pruning and watering, but the dirt never felt so good on my hands. Aunt Marlene made me work for every penny she was offering, but that was okay. The college days weren't a walk in the park. Aunt Marlene hooked me up big time, but the balance between the books and bills was like juggling knives. Drop one, and it could cut deep. I'd blink open in the mornings after cramming civil procedure, with my alarm buzzing like a bee in a jar, books spread across the desk like a buffet I didn't want to dig into. When my stomach grumbled, reminding me I was a human who needed fuel, I'd make a run to the nearest food joint on campus. Regular Lily, who manned the counter, would ask with a knowing look as I approached, make it a double? Long night ahead. You're going to burn out if you keep it like this, cheat war. Can't burn out when you're on fire. I'd quip, even though I felt more like kindling than a blaze. Nights turned into a blur of flashcards and frayed nerves. Whenever my phone buzzed, it was either a reminder for an unpaid bill or a message from Aunt Marlene asking how my day went. I always told her better than it actually was. Then things changed overnight. Aunt Marlene got real sick, like life-taking sick. I squeezed her hand more times than I could count in that too quiet hospital room. I couldn't say much. What do you say when the person who's your rock is crumbling? So who's going to yell at me for eating cookies in bed when you're gone? I tried to joke in one of those visits, struggling to keep it light. You better not, she'd rasp, voice a whisper, crumbs everywhere. We never talked about the money. It was like a silent agreement, the elephant in the room wearing a tooch and nobody wanted to comment on. After she passed, I sat in that stiff lawyer's office, more nervous than I ever was for any exam. When the lawyer, a stiff man with a comb over and glasses sliding down his nose, said, She's left you the house, Anna. It was like Aunt Marlene was still looking out for me. She what? I blinked, gears in my head grinding to a halt. The house, he fiddled with papers, a considerable amount for your student debts. The rest? Well, it's for you to figure out. Marlene was clear about making your own way. Despite the knot in my throat, I asked, did she say anything else? Just that she believed in you, he adjusted his glasses, and that she'd haunt you if you gave up. I laughed through the tears. That was Aunt Marlene in all right. Leaving the office that day, I felt heavier and lighter at the same time. She gave me a legacy, not just in bricks and mortar, 
but in the belief that I could finish this last lap without her. I was neck deep in prep for the next big exam when I heard the knock. Three sharp raps, the kind that tell you this ain't going to be a friendly how do you do. Pushing open the front door of Aunt Marlene's, my house, there they stood. Mom, Dad, Rachel, and her husband Dave, like some game reunion. Rachel wasted no time, her eyes hungry like she was window shopping. Anna, look at us all together again in this huge place, like a twisted sitcom, ain't it? I drawled, leaning against the doorframe. Anna. Dad started, in that tone, the kind that said, Sit down, shut up, we've decided. We've been talking. This house should be for Rachel. She's got kids, a family. I raised my brows, incredulity playing on my face. No kidding, sarcasm heavy as an anchor. Wrong house for that. Chat then. Mom's lips tightened, a sure sign she was ramping up to a guilt trip. You'll understand when you have your own family. This is just practical. I must have missed the part where practical meant kicking me out of my own home. I shot back, crossing my arms. Rachel chimed in, batting her eyelashes at me, then eyeing Dave for support, who just shrugged like he always did when she was shopping for a yes man. Sweetie, this house is wasted on you. We could give it life, laughter, children running around and what? Turn Aunt Marlene's parlor into a romper room? The idea felt like acid on my tongue. There's no need to be rude, Dave mumbled finally finding words. Right, because showing up to claim my house is peak civility, I snapped. You're being selfish, Anna, Dad grunted, convinced of his own righteousness. My laughter was bitter. Selfish. After years of keeping her in your thoughts during birthday cards, convenient memory you got there. They shuffled uneasy. This ain't how they imagined their gold digging would go. Anna, Mom softened her voice, the final play voice, think of the family. I matched her tone. I see now I am the part of the family that actually gives a damn. A standoff silence settled between us, the kind that's heavy and feels like it's stuffed with cotton. Rachel broke it predictably. You can be such a... Don't. I warned, just leave all of you. As they filed out the same door they came in, burdened by their disbelief and entitlement, Dad turned to me. You'll regret this. I stood tall, looking him square in the eye. The only thing I'll regret is not changing the lock sooner. The door shut behind them, and the silence was mine again. This unwelcome throwback was closed, inheritance or not. I was keeping Aunt Marlene's legacy, not auctioning it off to the highest bidder in my bloodline. I was beat, the kind of tired that sticks to your bones. Pulling into the driveway after a double shift at the law firm could do that to a person. All I wanted was a hot shower in my bed. As I jammed my key into the lock, it just ground against metal. What the? I muttered, fiddling with the key. That's when the door swung open. Rachel stood there, little Mia on her hip and a cocky tilt to her lips. Changed the locks, Anna. Surprise. My eyebrows shot up. Like hell you did. This is my house. Not anymore, she said, bouncing Mia, who seemed blissfully unaware of the adult drama. Anger bubbled up, hot and volatile. Watch me, I shot back, already dialing. Her smirk wavered. You're bluffing. With the dispatcher on the line, Rachel's confidence slipped another notch. Yes, my sisters illegally entered and changed the locks on my house, I explained loudly into the phone. Dad's truck pulled into the driveway just as I hung up. Him and Mom got out. Tag-teaming like this was some sort of intervention. Anna, be reasonable. Mom started, her eyes moist as if she were in a soap opera. I'm past reasonable, I said, 
not bothering to hide the edge in my voice. Dave stepped up to me, a good foot taller, trying to look menacing. Come on, Anna, he said, voice low, don't make a scene. I held up my phone with the recording button clearly on. Say that again, Dave, for the camera. His face turned the color of sour milk. Sirens cut through the heavy air as a cop car pulled into view. They stepped out, all stern looks and business. What seems to be the problem here? One officer asked, their bravado crumbling like stale bread. Dad's voice lost a few disciples. It's a misunderstanding, officers. Family matter. Stealing my home's a bit more than a family matter, I said, crossing my arms. The officers looked between us, taking in the scene. They were good at this, shifting gears as the situation unfolded. All right, let's start with some ID and we'll go from there, one of them said, pulling out a notepad. Reluctantly, Rachel handed Mia to Mom and dug into her purse. The legal tango had begun. They asked questions, we gave answers. Dad and Mom put on a show but the deed to the house was in my name, signed and sealed by Aunt Marlene's will. Can you prove you live here, ma'am? The officer asked me. Better, I can prove I own it, I said, reaching for my briefcase in the car. The sight of Aunt Marlene's will felt like the first deep breath I'd taken since stepping out of that damn car. The officers read it, their eyebrows lifting and dipping as they took in the legal ease. Seems clear to us, the officer said, folding the papers back into the briefcase. I suggest you hand over a set of keys to Miss here, otherwise we will have to proceed with charges for breaking and entering and unlawful eviction. Like pulling teeth, Rachel gave up a set of keys, Mom and Dad hushed up quick, and Dave. Well, he looked like he wanted the ground to swallow him whole. The cops escorted them off the property. Mom shot me a look like I'd kicked her kitten, but the law was the law, no room for sob stories. The door closed behind me with a click, like the final word in an argument. I leaned against it, the rush of adrenaline making my hand shake. Exhausted, I sludged into the kitchen to make a much-needed cup of coffee. As the kettle boiled, I thought about what my next move should be. The hefty click of the final lock snapping into place felt like the end of a long bad joke. My house now, fortress, needed just one more thing to be perfect. Maybe I'll get a big nasty dog, I muttered to nobody in particular. I wasn't much of a pet person, but the thought of some drooling monster that could scare off any would-be family intrusions brought a smirk to my face. Weeks stripped by. The silence from my family's end was louder than any shouting match we'd ever had. No calls, not even a lousy text. Sometimes, deep in the night when the work was done and the quiet was too much, I'd find myself on Rachel's social media page. She had a knack for the dramatic, photos of the kids' all sad eyes and pouty lips, captions nipping at my conscience. Little Timmy sure wishes he had a yard to play in, and Mia's third birthday without Auntie Anna. <sighs> Shuckle every time. Did she think I had amnesia, that I'd forget why I stood my ground and take pity? I remember the days when I begged for money to pay for my studies, and all I got were fancy speeches about responsibility and tough love. I can still feel the cold slamming of the door when I was broke and covering, and they told me they had no room. The way my own bedrock, my foundation, crumbled to dust beneath me. Nah, my new life was my making, my dues paid in full, my battles fought with no one in my corner. No amount of puppy-eyed pictures would change the history they wish I'd forget. I thought about posting a reply once, something snappy and a bit mean, but why bother? I had work to catch up on a stack of files on my table that didn't give a damn about family feuds. I had clients who depended on me, and that was the reality I chose to engage with. Sometimes, late into the evening, I'd pour myself some bourbon neat and sit in my backyard, the backyard they wanted to take from me. 
and I'd savor the quiet. I'd think about that guard dog again, a big one with a bark that would make my folks think twice before stepping onto the porch. Maybe a Rottweiler or a Mastiff, something with bite. My phone stayed quiet, a dead limb I'd long since learned to function without, and when I'd finally hit the sack, I'd sleep the sleep of the just or the wicked. I didn't care which, no ghosts of guilt to disturb my rest, no restless wondering about what-ifs, just the peace of knowing that from the four walls around me to the roof over my head, it was all mine through and through. The last thing I remember every night was the faint idea of getting that dog. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but the choice was mine, and that was good enough for me.